Abraham Lincoln always had a fascination with death. It stemmed from his earliest days and with the passing of his mother Nancy Hanks when he was nine years old, and followed when he was 18 by his sister Sarah, who died in childbirth. In the years to come, he would suffer the losses of his first love and two of his own children. It infused him with a sense of fatalism that colored his very outlook. Before leaving for Washington in 1861, he told William Herndon, his law partner and future biographer, that he was certain he would meet some terrible end. Four years later, when his prediction came to pass, a decision needed to be made about how to honor and remember the country's savior. It was decided that there would be a grand state funeral, the likes of which the country had never witnessed before, not even for George Washington. It would begin in the nation's capital, then the president's body would be taken by train back to Springfield, Illinois, retracing the route he had taken in 1861. The train would travel more than 1,600 miles, passing through 400 cities and towns, and over one million people would come out to view the president's remains. Come walk with me as we journey through history in Lincoln's final homecoming. The story begins on the night of April 14, 1865. It was Good Friday and the United States had been at peace for five days. On that day, President Lincoln was happier than he had been since before his first term in office. Some, including his wife Mary, said he was even giddy. His mood was in stark contrast to what it had been over the last four years of a seemingly unending civil war that had consumed the country so that the president once remarked that the very heavens seemed to be draped in black. During those years, Lincoln found comfort in the theater. He confided that there was something about being in a darkened theater where he was alone and yet with other people, who all shared in thrills and laughter that helped him to bear his cross. His critics viewed his theater going as villainy and blasted him mercilessly for taking part in frivolous entertainments while men were dying on the battlefield. On April 14th, Mary insisted they go to Ford's theater to see the comedy Our American Cousin starring Laura Keene, who was leaving the long-running show. However, Lincoln was not eager to go. With the nation reunited, he wanted to begin laying out the plans to rebuild, but he knew if he defied his wife's wishes, he would only be inciting her wrath. The Lincolns and their guests arrived at Ford's Theater at 8.25 when the play was in the middle of the first act. His attendance had been expected, and when his party made their way to the presidential box, the performance stopped and the audience applauded and cheered as the orchestra played Hail to the Chief. The president bowed and took his seat beside his wife. On stage, the actors picked up the scene where they had left off, and the audience settled in for the rest of the performance. They all knew that it would be a night they would tell their grandchildren about, but none of them had any idea of the tragedy that was about to happen. As the play reached the third act, a shadowy figure crept along the dress circle toward the president's box. He had no trouble entering through the door as it had been left unguarded. Those who heard the muffled gunshot believed it was part of the play. Moments later, a man leapt from the president's box and fell to his knees. He stumbled to center stage where he raised a bloody dagger above his head and cried, Sic semper tyrannis, thus always to tyrants. As the dark-featured man limped off the stage, someone said that he looked like actor John Wilkes Booth. A murmur arose from the bewildered audience as many still wondered what was happening. Then a blood-curdling scream came from the president's box. Mary Lincoln's cry of utter desperation dispelled any notion that what just happened was all an act. An army surgeon who was attending the performance was lifted into the box and discovered that Lincoln had suffered a single gunshot wound to the back of the head. 
Although the president was still alive, the surgeon declared his injury was mortal. Not wanting to have the president die in a theater, it was decided that he would be moved across the street to the Peterson boarding house. He was brought to a back room and stretched out diagonally on a bed that was too short for his six foot four inch frame. And it was there nine hours later that Abraham Lincoln, a man born in the wilderness of Kentucky, and who through the strength of his own will rose from humble clay to the highest office in the nation, drew his last breath. As his widow, nearly paralyzed with grief, was being taken back to the White House, she looked up at Ford's theater and shrieked, Oh, that dreadful house! Lincoln's death put the country into deep mourning of a kind it had never seen before. It was unimaginable how someone with his strength could be snuffed out by a single desperate act. From the very beginning it was understood that for a loss of such magnitude that was felt on a personal level by so many would require a funeral equal in greatness to the man himself. On April 17th, Abraham Lincoln's casket was placed in the East Room of the White House. As the public was admitted the following day, the somber scene recalled a prophetic dream the President related to his bodyguard days earlier. He described that in the dream he awoke to the sound of great sobbing. Rising from his bed, he walked the deserted halls of the mansion in search of the source of such intense sorrow. Finally, he came to the East Room where he saw a coffin placed upon a catafalque draped in funeral vestments. He asked a soldier standing guard who was dead in the White House. The President was his answer. He was killed by an assassin. The dream had disturbed Lincoln so that he slept no more that night. From the White House, Lincoln's coffin was conveyed up Pennsylvania Avenue to the Capitol building. It was accompanied by a massive procession that marched to the staccato roll of muffled drums. It was brought into the rotunda and placed beneath the newly constructed dome where he lay in state. Early in the morning of the 21st, the new president, Andrew Johnson, was at the train depot to see his predecessor off on his final journey. The funeral train consisted of nine cars and an engine all draped in black. Over 300 dignitaries and friends would travel in escort. Mary Lincoln, still overcome with grief, would remain in Washington with both of her surviving sons. On the day he died, Lincoln had been scheduled to inspect a special train car built to carry him on official business. Never having had the chance to use it in life, it would now bring his coffin and the coffin of his cherished son, Willie, back to Springfield. Never traveling more than 20 miles per hour, the funeral train would stop in key cities along the way so that a grieving nation could view the remains of their fallen leader. The funeral train's first stop was at Baltimore, a city where four years earlier, rumors of assassination prompted Lincoln's chief of security, Alan Pinkerton, to have the president-elect skip his announced stop and enter the city unannounced. The decision caused an immediate uproar, and critics of the new president called him a coward and suggested he wore a disguise to escape notice. But now, with death being the ultimate conciliator, he was welcomed as a martyred hero and savior. The funeral procession planned at Pennsylvania's capital city was canceled due to severe thunderstorms. But despite the weather, thousands came out to view the president's coffin as it lay in state at the Capitol building. The next day, as the train passed Lancaster, Pennsylvania, an elderly gentleman stood with hat in hand at the rail depot to watch it go by. It was former President James Buchanan, Lincoln's predecessor, who five years earlier stood by in a similar manner as the southern states left the Union. <laughs> 
In Philadelphia, Lincoln's coffin was taken to Independence Hall and placed in the same room where the Declaration of Independence was signed. When the public viewing began early on April 23rd, the lines were miles long. By mid-morning, the crowds at 5th and Chestnut Streets feared they would not have a chance to see their martyred president and began surging forward. The crush of people resulted in dozens of injuries, but it did not discourage the public from coming to pay their respects. When the funeral train reached Jersey City, President Lincoln's remains were taken by ferry across the Hudson River and placed in the rotunda of New York City Hall. Just before the doors were opened to the public, photographer Jeremiah Gurney was permitted to set up his camera and took the only known photograph of Lincoln and death. For years, the image was believed lost until 1952 when it was rediscovered by a 14-year-old Lincoln enthusiast. On April 25th, the grand funeral procession marched up Broadway. When it reached Union Square, it passed the mansion of Cornelius Roosevelt. A photographer captured the moment and by chance caught the images of a six-year-old future president Theodore Roosevelt and his brother Elliot watching from the window of their grandfather's house. New York City was also the site of an ugly occurrence that marred the solemn event. When the procession was being planned, over 5,000 African Americans announced their desire to join in the march. However, the city council, which was tightly controlled by Tammany Hall, issued an immediate ban. Upon hearing the news, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton issued an order forbidding discrimination against people of color. The city council was forced to reverse themselves, but sadly, most African Americans, fearing reprisals and arrest, stayed away. From New York City, the funeral train traveled north to the state capital of Albany. And here, as everywhere, throngs of people were on hand to share in a moment of history. In the afternoon of April 26th, it began its journey west to Buffalo. Three hundred and sixty miles away, while the funeral train was in Albany, President Lincoln's assassin, John Wilkes Booth, who had been on the run for 12 days, was cornered in a tobacco barn in the pre-dawn hours by a detachment of Union soldiers. Armed with carbine and pistols, he refused to surrender, forcing the soldiers to set the barn ablaze. Then a single bullet was fired at the assassin, striking him in the neck and partially severing his spinal cord. Booth was dragged from the barn, and as he lay paralyzed and dying, he asked the soldiers to hold his hands up to his face. His last words were, useless, useless. There would be no grand funeral for the dashing actor who thrilled so many on the stage. His body would be brought aboard the ironclad USS Montauk, where it was identified before an autopsy was performed. It was falsely reported that he was buried at sea when in fact he was secretly interred at the old Capitol prison in Washington, D.C., and then at the Federal Arsenal. Finally, in 1869, his remains were turned over to his family. He is buried in an unmarked grave within the Booth family plot at Greenmount Cemetery in Baltimore, where visitors leave pennies with the image of Lincoln. At Buffalo, the coffin was placed in St. James Hall. One of the people who came to pay his respects was the nation's 13th president, Millard Fillmore. Fillmore had no love for Lincoln in life and in the 1864 election had campaigned for his opponent. But on this day, old rivalries were forgotten. Another mourner who came was a young attorney named Grover Cleveland who avoided the draft during the Civil War by hiring a substitute to serve in his place. Within 20 years' time, he would become the 22nd President of the United States. On its journey from Buffalo to Cleveland, the funeral train passed the small town of Westfield, New York, that was the home of Grace Bedell, the young girl who wrote a letter to candidate Lincoln in 1860, suggesting that he grow a beard. <laughs> 
In Cleveland, the problem of overcrowding and slow lines was solved by placing the president's catafalque beneath an outdoors canopy in Monument Square. They claim that in so doing, it permitted over 10,000 people per hour to pass by his coffin. The citizens of Columbus greeted the slain president as a savior by tossing roses under the wheels of his hearse. As in all the cities preceding it, muffled drums, church bells, and distant cannon fire were heard as the procession advanced towards the State House. It was early in the morning hours of April 30th when the funeral train crossed into Indiana. The state was Lincoln's home from age eight until he was 21. It was where his mother and sister were buried, and it was where his father Thomas married his stepmother Sally Bush, and it was she who recognized his wonderful mind and put him on the path to greatness. After leaving Indianapolis, the funeral train made an unscheduled stop in Michigan City, Indiana, where over 100 dignitaries from Chicago boarded the train to accompany their state's adopted son home. The layover was less than an hour, but the people of Michigan City made the most of the time they had. On the morning of May 1st, people gathered along the shore of Lake Michigan to watch as the funeral train rolled slowly over the Illinois Central train trestle. Lincoln had many connections in the city of Chicago, going back to his days as a circuit lawyer. It was here that many of his most famous cases had been tried, and it was where in 1860 Lincoln became the Republican nominee for President of the United States. With so much shared history, the city vowed that its reception would far exceed New York. The funeral procession made its way along streets that were overflowing. Windows and rooftops of every building were also filled with somber faces. He was brought to the Cook County Courthouse where his coffin would again be opened so that mourners might look upon his face. The light in the viewing chamber was kept dim to make the ravages of death less evident, but people could still plainly see the dark discoloration under Lincoln's right eye where Booth's infernal missile had lodged. At 8 p.m. on May 2nd, the coffin was closed and by torchlight was borne by eight horses to the train depot where it would begin the final leg of its journey. When the funeral train left Chicago, 11 days had passed since it began its journey. It traveled 1,600 miles, crossing seven states and hundreds of towns, both big and small. Now it crossed into the rolling prairie beneath a broad open sky. It was the land that Lincoln knew best and felt the most at home. Along the tracks, bonfires lighted the way and thousands waited and watched throughout the night to see one of their own born to his rest. When the train came into view in the gray light of dawn, farmers plowing their fields stopped and removed their hats until it was out of sight. Young children who knew little about Lincoln would remember the moment long into their lives as the first time they saw their parents weep. It was how most of this new generation would come to understand just how much Abraham Lincoln meant. In Springfield on May 3rd, the funeral train arrived at the Chicago and Alton Depot. The windows of the station were hung with black curtains and streamers. For those who were there, it conjured memories of February 1861, when Lincoln bade an emotional goodbye to his friends and neighbors, to whom he said he owed everything. On April 14th, news of Lincoln's assassination reached Springfield by telegraph about an hour after it happened. From that moment, the city Lincoln called home entered a period of deep mourning. There were hardly any buildings or public squares that weren't decorated in black. And there was an overnight interest in visiting the places that Lincoln had frequented. Visitors went to his old law office, seen here festooned with a banner stating that he lives in the hearts of the people, 
In this photo, a collection of top-hatted men pose in front of the Globe Tavern on Adams Street, where Abraham and Mary lived after they were married, and where their son Robert was born. But the one location that everyone went to see was the frame house on the corner of 8th and Jackson Streets that had been Lincoln's home from 1844 to 1861. It was the only home he ever owned, and it was where three of his four children were born and where one died. In 1860, a large rally was held there so Republican delegates could meet their presidential candidate. And now, five years later, it was the site of similar gatherings, and in the days leading up to the funeral, the number of mourning decorations increased until the house was nearly covered. With the influx of so many tourists came the demand for souvenirs. Peddlers sold pictures of the slain president and his family, and for those who wanted a more intimate look into their private lives, they had images of his house, both outside and inside, which included views of the front parlor, and the room he and Mary had slept in. Photos of the Lincoln animals were also popular. They included his horse old Bob and his dog Fido. Priced at 10 cents a piece for the carte de visite size and a quarter for the larger cabinet cards, they sold as fast as they could be produced. Photographers took stereo images of the cortege as it marched to the state capitol. The venerable building stood across the street from Lincoln's old law office and had been his second home. His presence in its chambers and halls was as familiar as the yellow limestone that made up its facade. In 1858, he had given one of his most important speeches here about the evils of slavery. He wrote the speech in the state library, seated at a desk like these. It was delivered at the Republican State Convention. At the time, he was running for the United States Senate against incumbent Stephen A. Douglas. Borrowing from the Bible, he said, A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. He said those words here in the Hall of Representatives, standing beneath this portrait of George Washington. Now on May 3rd, 1865, the same place was prepared for him once more, only the speaker's podium was replaced with a catafalque. It was a surreal scene outside as people silently and orderly moved through the gate and up the steps of the Capitol. They came throughout the night and into the next morning. It was estimated that in all, over 75,000 people passed through this room. Along the front of the gallery appeared a quote from a speech Lincoln made in 1861 about the freedom that was promised for all within the Declaration of Independence. He said, sooner than surrender these principles, I would rather be assassinated on this spot. Many Springfieldians had known him personally and could still recall the infinite supply of humorous stories he told that were always apropos for the occasion. Many others knew him by reputation only, but could still recall the brief exchanges of greeting they shared with him on the street. When they heard the news he had been killed, it came like a thunderbolt, and they could hardly believe that it was so. Now, as they filed past his coffin, they could finally see for themselves that it was true. In 1861, the process of arterial embalming was a new science that gained in popularity in the United States during the Civil War. It made it possible for families to preserve the remains of their loved ones fallen in battle until they could be shipped home for burial. Lincoln was introduced to the process when his close friend and law student, Colonel Elmer Ellsworth, was killed on May 24, 1861. He died while removing a Confederate flag from a building in Alexandria, Virginia, becoming the first Union officer to die in the Civil War. After his body was embalmed, it lay in state in the East Room of the White House. Mary Lincoln remarked that the young man appeared to be in peaceful slumber rather than in the cold embrace of death. 
The Lincolns remembered the miracle process a mere nine months later when their beloved son Willie succumbed to typhoid fever at age 11. The weight of the parents' bereavement was profound. Mary was nearly catatonic and secluded herself in her room where she claimed that Willie's ghost paid nightly visits. Lincoln was also overcome with grief and given to bouts of uncontrollable sobbing. It was said that on at least two separate occasions he went to the mausoleum at Oak Hill Cemetery in Georgetown and had his son's casket open so that he might gaze upon his face. The preservation of Willie's body was a testament to the embalmer's artistry. President Lincoln's state funeral was the longest and most elaborate the country would ever see. The 1,600-mile, 20-day journey put the science of embalming to the ultimate test. At the time, the chemicals used in preserving remains included arsenic, creosote, mercury, and turpentine, among others. Formaldehyde would not be commercially produced until the 1880s. Among the hundreds of dignitaries on board the funeral train was Dr. Charles D. Brown, Lincoln's embalmer, who had the task of readying the fallen leader for the multiple viewings along the way. The president seemed to hold up well on the first leg. However, on April 25th, the New York Times reported the following. To those who had not seen Mr. Lincoln in life, the view may be satisfactory, but to those who were familiar with his features, it is far otherwise. The color is leaden, almost brown. The forehead recedes sharp and clearly marked. The eyes deep sunk and close held upon the sockets. The cheekbones, always high, are unusually prominent. The cheeks hollowed and deep pitted. The unnaturally thin lips shut tight and firm as if glued together, and the small chin covered with slight beard, seemed pointed and sharp. The body is dressed in black, the white turned over collar, and the clean white gloves make a strong contrast to the black velvet cloth and leaden-hued features. This is all that remains of the man whom goodness made great, and whose rest in the hearts of the people is forever and abiding. It will not be possible, despite the affection of the embalming, to continue much longer the exhibition as the constant shaking of the body, aided by the exposure to the air and the increasing of dust, has already undone much of the embalmer's workmanship, and it is doubtful if it will be decreed wise to tempt dissolution much further. A week later, when the funeral train reached Springfield, the coffin was placed in the State House, and when it was opened, Dr. Brown was shocked by what he saw. To his utter distress, he discovered that Lincoln's face had turned completely black. As the public clamored to be admitted into the viewing chamber, the doctor knew there was no chance they would be allowed to see the body in such a dreadful state. And furthermore, he had no idea what to do about it. Local undertaker Thomas Lynch offered to assist. He wrote the following account of what happened next. I called at a neighboring drugstore and procured a rouge chalk and amber with such brushes as I needed and returned to the room. I at once set about coloring the president's features, placing the materials on very thick so as to completely hide the discoloration of the skin. In half an hour, I had finished my task and the doors were thrown open to the public. However, Lynch's best efforts could not mask all the ravages of decomposition. In her book, 20 Days, Dorothy Meserve Cunhart wrote that hardly anyone shed tears while making the trip past the coffin. They were too shocked by what they saw. But outside on the streets, they broke down and wept. Everyone asked everyone else what he had thought of the remains and most people felt they had a duty to Lincoln's memory to lie. They said for the most part he looked peaceful and as if merely asleep. Children especially would forever remember the sight or hear their friends tell of it and remember it in that way. And many of them that evening went to their rooms alone and made entries in their diaries like this one of a young Springfield girl named Anna Ridgely. Crowds of people went to see it. Men, women, and children gazed upon the decaying corpse. I am thankful I did not go, 
for I know the image would have remained in my mind. My sister Janie went with the Philharmonic Society to sing and sat where she could not help but look upon the body for an hour. The air was scented with evergreen which was placed all around the room and the poor child came near fainting. She was so nervous when she came home, I feared she would not sleep. After the last mourner had passed through the Hall of Representatives, Lincoln's coffin was closed and moved to a waiting hearse. The hearse was a magnificent vehicle loaned to the city of Springfield by the mayor of St. Louis. Richly appointed with silver and gold and topped with ostrich feather plumes, it carried the president's coffin to Oak Ridge Cemetery in the last and most somber of all the processions. When it arrived at the cemetery, the crowds were so thick that there was hardly a patch of open ground. People stood in the sun, weeping softly through each oration and musical presentation until the final prayer was delivered. Then his coffin was placed in the receiving vault and locked behind thick iron doors. He had been dead for 20 days, and now Abraham Lincoln truly did belong to the ages. Abraham Lincoln's story did not end with his death. In part two, we will see the country grapple with how to honor and preserve his memory. As plans to build his tomb commenced, a dispute between his widow and the city of Springfield almost resulted in him being laid to rest outside of his adopted home. The people are in a rage, and all the hard stories that were ever told about her are told over again. She has no friends here. Years behind schedule, the dedication ceremony went ahead, but what the distinguished guests did not know was that construction was still going on and that the very ground they were standing on would one day threaten the tomb's future. When it was done, it was intended to be a place where the public could come and pay respects to their fallen hero and where he would rest forever in peace. However, time, the elements, and an unthinkable human threat put his sacred remains and a nation's honor in peril. We will see Lincoln reborn as a national savior and how the shadow of this new image fell upon the family he left behind. Finally, through the eyes of a young man, we will lift the veil and gaze once more upon the face of Lincoln. Come walk with me as the story continues in the next Grave Explorations. <laughs>